There's something wrong with our civilization. Beneath the surface, there are forces at work which we don't understand. In the last 10 years, there's been a revolution in biological science. Yet our understanding of ourselves in a broader social context is trailing far behind. Throughout this series, we're going to look at what civilization is, what it really is from the ground up. We're going to explore why major wars take place, why civilizations rise and why they collapse, why our economies are stagnating, why we're having fewer children and what this means for our future. By searching our past and looking for clues in our close biological cousins, we'll uncover the hidden mechanisms that drive human behavior. We'll show how temperament, the psychological and emotional foundations of personality, underpins our behavior, our virtues, our vices, the economy, and even our government. We'll show that temperament has a biological basis that changes over time, defining our culture and shaping our identity right down to our DNA. Why did civilization arise? Was it due to the gradual development of technology, institutions and infrastructure? These are clearly important factors, but on an even more fundamental level, civilization requires attitudes and behaviors that make these developments possible. Working long hours, the drive to innovate, and the adherence to ideas and principles that are completely abstract, like paper money or a constitution. So where have these attitudes come from? How have we changed from hunter-gatherers to people behaving like this? To understand how this occurred, we need to look wider, beyond our species, and to the behavior of our close biological cousins. Let's start with gibbons. Gibbons are tree-dwelling apes that live in tropical rainforests. This might give you the impression that they are well-fed, but this is not the case. Due to the lack of predation, their populations tend to grow to the absolute carrying capacity of the land, which means that they are often hungry. In order to survive, gibbons must maintain exclusive feeding territories and be always active in the search for food. To avoid overpopulation, they delay breeding and are less sexually active than most other primates. They also tend to form tight nuclear families with a single mating pair and finally, as offspring are such an energy-intensive investment, they tend to care for them diligently and for a comparatively long period to ensure maximum survival. By contrast, savannah baboons are often killed by lions and leopards, which keeps numbers down, meaning food is more abundant. This creates a very different attitude, in which baboons feel less compelled to search for food and are more sexually active, and also tend to have multiple partners, they breed early and often and spend far less time caring for their young. All great strategies when sheer numbers are the key to survival. Baboons are also both highly aggressive and cooperative, which is part of a separate survival strategy that we'll be dealing with in the next episode. Now, when the supply of food changes, many animals can adapt their behavior. When food is short, they act more like gibbons. And when it is plentiful, more like baboons. This helps them to maximize their chance of survival. So what does all of this have to do with humans? And how does it help us to understand civilization? To answer this, let's look at the behavior of our hunter-gatherer ancestors. While humans have naturally strong pair bonds like gibbons, in other ways we acted more like baboons. From what we know, they didn't work especially hard. Their sexual relations began early in life and were fairly open. They didn't usually form stable nuclear families or control their children too closely after infancy. The behavior of civilized peoples, on the other hand, more closely resembles what we've seen in gibbons. They are more likely to be monogamous, control sexual activity, have children later, and discipline them more intensely. They also settle into fixed locations and typically spend much more time working. In fact, and now here's the crucial point, History shows us that as civilizations rise, people gradually adopt these gibbon behaviors. Collectively, we call these traits C for civilization. C is a complex of behavioral and physiological traits that can be activated by environmental factors such as hunger. 
Levels of C can vary between individuals and groups and can change over time. To understand how the C system works, we need to look at a relatively new field of biology called epigenetics. While your DNA remains the same throughout your life, the way your genes are expressed can vary widely depending on environmental influences. Moreover, some of these changes can be passed on to the next generation. These changes can alter the way your body functions, including levels of circulating hormones and even brain activity, influencing the way we feel and think, and ultimately, the way we behave. Our current understanding is that the C-system is a complex of epigenetic changes that can be activated by conditions such as chronic food shortage. When we were hunter-gatherers, there was no real advantage to high C. But when we discovered agriculture, high C helped people by allowing them to work harder. The same scarcity mentality that drives gibbons to search for food gave farmers the patience and determination to work hard in the fields day in and day out and to plan for the future. But while high C behavior in gibbons reduces the birth rate, in human cultures it can have the opposite effect. By making people more interested in children in general, the ability to work hard combined with a higher birth rate meant that farming communities could grow more food and were typically more numerous than their lowest sea neighbours. But hang on, how can well-fed farmers maintain high levels of sea if sea itself is associated with chronic food shortage? Recent scientific studies suggest that there are other ways of activating the sea system. Biohistory proposes that any behaviour deriving from high sea increases sea by convincing the body that it is in an environment that requires a high C response. Reduced sexual activity, hard repetitive work, and the conscious restriction of food all serve to raise C when practiced independently. This system is called the effect feedback cycle, and activating it, although notoriously difficult, is essential for any society to maintain a competitive edge. Throughout history, societies that achieved high C tended to overrun those with lower C. Given this, it's no surprise that civilizations are accompanied by religions or philosophies that enforce C-promoting behaviors. These include fasting, disciplined rules and rituals, and chastity. These C-promoting behaviors are so contrary to our basic nature that it can take generations of cultural reinforcement for people to adopt them. The cultural practices that serve to promote C are known as C promoters and are just as fundamental to building and maintaining a civilization as physical technologies such as metalwork or writing. This is because they create the temperamental basis upon which civilization is built. But farming and religious practice are only two aspects of civilized culture. What about the economy? military effectiveness and our political institutions. These we'll consider in the next episode.